You go ahead and stretch your hands forward right now to all these cards that are up here. We're going to pray over these souls. These are kids. These are sons, daughters, moms, dads, uncles, grandpas, neighbors, nieces, nephews. In this, Some people are here locally. They're going to come to church. We're going to believe on Sunday. Some of these people live out of state. They're going to get saved wherever they live. God's going to start to touch them. Stretch your hands forward right now to these cards. Stretch them. Begin to pray right now for these souls. Don't wait for me to pray. Just begin to pray for these souls right now. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 18, I think it's verse 19, when two people come in an agreement, it is done in the name of Jesus. We have about a 1,000 people in this room right now agreeing. Begin to pray right now. Begin to pray, church. We pray right now for these souls. We pray, Lord, they live locally. They're going to come to church in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Take off the blinders off of their eyes. Take off the spiritual blinders off of their minds. And we just thank you right now. They will say yes to come to church. They will say yes for salvation. They will say yes to you, God. Touch them, Lord. Deliver them right now in the name of Jesus. Minister and angels, go. Minister and angels, go to their homes. Go to the workplace, wherever they're at. Touch them, God. Wake them up. Give them a dream tonight. I pray these people, they won't be able to sleep for the next 24 hours. They will say, yes, I'm going to church. Yes, I need to come back to God. Yes, the backsliders are coming back. The Lord just told me backsliders are coming back. Keep on praying, church. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Backsliders are coming back. Backsliders, keep on praying. Another 20 seconds. Keep on praying. We thank you, Lord. Touch these souls, God. Dads and moms and uncles and sisters and brothers, co-workers and neighbors, God, we thank you. We thank you, God. This is the reason why you came, Jesus, to restore us back to God, to restore us back to the Father. You are the God of reconciliation, God. You reconcile us back to the Father, Jesus. That's what you did on the cross. That's what you did on Calvary, God. We thank you. And we all agree. In the name of Jesus, and everyone shout, Amen. Give the Lord a big shout of praise right now. We're believing for these souls. Janet, you guys can continue standing for a second because we got Pastor Chris, our Pomona pastor, giving a word tonight. But remain standing. We, Janet, Friday, we have Good Friday. We're going to have the passion experience. A lot of people are asking, what is that? Service starts at 7, but you don't want to get here at 7. You want to get here a lot earlier because what's taking place at 6 o'clock on Friday? You do not want to miss this. Some of you have seen it, but some of you have not experienced yet. We start off Good Friday, you guys, at 6 o'clock. This entire foyer will be transformed. We will have, um, the drama team has been preparing. Um, we have the, the scene where Jesus, you know, is praying to the Father before he goes um, to the cross. Then we have a scene where the soldiers are taking him and flogging him. And then we do a procession right in the middle. You get to be a part of that right in the center. Jesus is going to walk right through the crowd, which means we need you here. And you will sense just an anointing where you get to experience wow. for a moment and remember the sacrifice that God did for us. Then we're going to have a Via Dolorosa as we see Jesus coming in. And then, Man. then we're going to end up with a message. Yeah. You know, we're we're going to do like an interactive word. I'm going to teach for like 10, 15 minutes. And then the drama team, we're going to reenact the crucifixion scene. So right. you don't want to, then after that, I'll re, we'll, we'll recap it after awesome. that. The worship, we're going to have communion. So really, I would get it like at 545 oh on Friday. Goodness. No, no, but there's something else. You might, they might have to cancel work some of these people I, to I get here. They may have to it's going to be good Friday, yeah. 6 o'clock. Passion experience will start at 6 o'clock. There's something else yeah. that I forgot to tell you. So when you come, um, you're going to get to experience the Passover meal. Oh. So we have unleavened bread that will be served. We're going to have lentil. We're going to have stew. We're taking you back, back to Jerusalem on Friday. You're going to get to experience We're taking you back that. to Jerusalem. Yeah. It's so going to be good, you guys. So it. 6 o'clock on Friday. Passion experience will start in the 7 o'clock. Our service. Give it up for Janet, the Don't drama team, it, the, the production team. They do a great job. Now, 
Give it up for Pastor Chris, our Pomona pastor, as he brings a fire word for us tonight. Let's do it. Have you, brother. Man, good evening, everyone. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. I'm going to go ahead and open this. I know we've been doing a lot of praying, but we, there's, a lot, there's a lot that we need to be praying for. Amen? I love how they put all of these, the, these cards in here. They, I looked at this. I'm like, man, this is beautiful. These aren't just names on a paper, you guys. What this is, these, each and every one of these, these are souls in here. We need to begin to look at it that way. We don't want to, to, to neglect the season that we're in right now. This week is, I believe, to be the greatest week in the history of all the universe. I, I mean, come on, you guys. Are you excited about it? And why do I say that? Especially for us that, that realized that we needed a Savior, that we, we were sinning, we were lost in the world. This is an exciting time for us. That somebody actually came and paid the price for us? Are you kidding me? There's no greater time in history than this week, Passion Week. So, you guys, let's get excited about this. But I also want you to know that this is also a time of refocus. We, for those of us, we, we celebrate it. We come in. We go to all the services. But understand that this is a time to refocus on what God is calling us to do. Yes, it's amazing. We celebrate the fact that he, he went and he died on the cross for us. But we also have to remember that there is a purpose behind it. He didn't just save us just to save us. He said, okay, I've got you. I love you so much. But now I have something that I need you to do. And when we talk about writing names on these, on these papers, you guys, I, I don't know if we can still do it. But don't leave this place today without grabbing a card. Maybe you didn't put one in today, right now. But understand that God is calling us to do a work. And it starts with an invite. We're going to write down our, the, the names of the people on it, and then we're going to invite them. So today, you guys, as I go into this, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for the word that you're going to put forth. Father, I pray that it is all of you, it is none of me. I pray that this word would, would fall on, on softened hearts, Father, that we would receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> so what, what I wanted to speak to everybody about today, well, I'm going to say the Lord because it's definitely not from me. Is, is in this season we talk about what, a refocus and what is God having us to do. One of the greatest things that we can do is to make sure that we are passing on to the next generation our faith. And when I mean our faith, I'm not saying what, what statistically has been proven and shown what Christianity is today. And what I mean by that is we are not just a bunch of churchgoers. We don't just go, oh, that's our, day, that's our Sunday routine is that we show up to church. Because how I many of you know we can pass that on to the next generation? What ends up happening is you know as well as I do that coming to church is great. But to be honest with you, when you get home, issues pop up. And all of a sudden we thought because we went to church that everything was supposed to change. I go to church, why didn't it stop these things from happening. There's no power in it. And don't get me wrong, I'm telling you, come to church. It's one of the things that we do. But don't think that this is all that God is requiring from us. And, and you know what? Something that, that I looked at King David, I, I look at a lot of these kings throughout the Bible, they were so worried about their next generation, about the legacy that they left. And we in this generation, in this society today, we can see that being diminished. We are not passing things on. In fact, we are not passing our faith on. Because we are passing something on. And I don't want any one of you to be deceived thinking 
that what you do will not affect the next generation. Today, you guys, I'm going to speak very briefly. And I love what Pastor, when Pastor Brian was up here, uh, uh, our brother, our pastor from Kenya, he said this. He said, I'm not going to preach long because I'll find out that I'll be preaching to an empty room. So I'm going to keep this one short. The title I was given was Don't Fool Yourself. I know these are tough pills to swallow. <laughs> but you guys, we are here to learn. I'm not here to tickle your ear. I'm not here to tell you that everything is kumbaya and, and butterflies and rainbows. I'm here so that we get something out of this. We need to get a refocus on what we've been doing and how we've been living. So don't throw rocks. It's not my work. So don't fool yourself. What are you passing on? In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 2 in NLT, it says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very different times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Sounds a lot like where we're at right now, right? But what did it say right here? People would be lovers of themselves. This is what we are passing on as a culture to the next generation. We're not passing on, look at son, look at daughter. I'm sacrificing myself for you. We become so selfish. Oh, you know what? Mama wants to go to the club tonight. You're going to you're gonna have to do without. Daddy wants to go out and daddy wants to do his thing. Daddy has to go do some dumb stuff, get himself locked up. Right? Not thinking. And I'm talking to myself, guys. This is where I was at. We have no consciousness. We, we just look at it as, I've got to get mine. I've got to do for me. We don't look at the consequences that my son and my daughter is going to grow up thinking that this is okay. Beating on a woman and then expecting my daughter, oh, you shouldn't let no man beat on you as you're beating up on her mama. I'm just saying, just saying, guys. We need to come into a place. We need to come back to a place where we begin to check ourselves. You know what? Yeah, no, I'm not going to do this. I want to make sure that my, my kids are set up, the next generation is set up, for not only for my, this generation, but for the next one and the next one and the next one. Deception is everywhere, you guys. Everywhere. And when I mean everywhere, I mean everywhere. You can look on billboards. You turn on the radio. You go on your phones. Commercials on TV. Conversations at work. Thinking that these things are okay. Deception. But the worst deception that we can, we can come across is self-deception. When we believe, when we begin to believe that it's okay, we fall into the trap. It's really quiet tonight, guys. <laughs> and James 1, 22 through 24, and this is in the message version, guys. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the word go into one ear and out of the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear, the, those who hear and don't act are like those who, who glance in the mirror and walk away. And two minutes later, they have no idea who they are or what they look like. I'm going to drop three principles on you. I'm going to drop three ways that we can deceive ourselves. And, but I want you to remember this. As I'm speaking these principles, it's not just about the, these three ways that we can deceive ourselves. This is lining up. Everything is lining up for the generations to come. We got that? How many of you got that? Okay. So the first one is fooling yourself by thinking that you're a Christian. Ooh, I knew that one was going to be real quiet. The first one, the first, the, the first one of fooling ourselves is fooling yourself to thinking that you are a Christian when you don't live a lifestyle of one. I don't know if you're in agreement with that or you're not, but 
Understand, you guys, Christ, being a Christian, this is what we got mixed up. We begin to think that being a Christian is a title. Oh, I'm a Christian because I wear a Christian shirt. Because I go to church, oh, I'm a Christian. I want you to understand, the word Christian was given to the disciples first. And what they were saying was, hey, there goes a little Christ, there goes a Christian. And what they were saying was, there goes a little Christ. Somebody who acted and spoke just like Jesus did. We, can, we should not be deceived. We, a lot of us, and I'm not saying in this room, but I'm saying a lot of us are deceived by thinking that, oh, we, we can go ahead and we can do the things that we're doing, and I'm still a Christian. God's grace, love, and mercy covers me. Yes, it does. But don't call your, don't go to the club. Isn't that crazy? You go to the club, you're dancing, you're all twerking on somebody, and you got a, you got a drink in your hand, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Come to find out that guy says, oh, I'm a Christian too. You're like, what? Really, guys? Please don't say that in the club. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. We need to make sure that our lifestyle lines up with it, right? We need to be a generation that shows the next generation, no, that's not what we do. The title or the the the, the the word Christian comes from a lifestyle. It's not a title. Somebody should call you and know that you are a Christian before they even talk to you. It's not because you say, I'm a Christian. They say, oh, yeah, I already know because I see the lifestyle you live. Do not fool yourself. Do not fool yourself. If we say that we have fellowship, let me jump back up. In 1 John 1, 6, it says, so we are lying if we say that we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Christians practice the truth. Say that. Christians practice the truth. One more time. Christians practice the truth. That means when something comes up, we say no. When God says to go, we go, right? We don't make a bunch of excuses. Just saying. So if you say that we, we have fellowship, then our lifestyle should reflect what you believe to be the truth. If we believe that Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, goes to the cross, gets beaten, then goes to the cross for our sins, then it should reflect it. We shouldn't just be doing any old thing we want because society tells us that it's okay now. We've been called to be set apart. He said that it's going to be, we're going to look different, peculiar, right? <laughs> I knew that was coming. So many people fool themselves that they can live a half obedient life and say that they are Christians or a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, you can't say that you're following Christ and still living the same way you want to. Because on it, the truth is that you're still doing what you want. You're actually not following Christ. All right, let, let, me, let me stay on here. So the second point, or I'm sorry, Luke 6, 46. It says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Is that not simple enough for you? And I'm not talking about somebody who's struggling with something. I'm talking about people who are practicing and trying to use grace as a cover-up to do what you want to do. <laughs> Number two, fooling yourself by thinking that you can get away with sin. In Luke 12, 2 through 3, it says, the time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed. And all that is secret will be known to all. Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered behind closed doors, ooh, will be shouted from the rooftops for all to hear. Let it be so, Lord. Hold us accountable. So, 
a lot of times we, we'll, we'll go on thinking that, and this is where, we, where we're at today with sin. Sometimes we could just even begin to, to justify it, right? We say, oh, well, I just need this, this uh, after a long day, I just need to take down this 20-pack. It relaxes me. We can justify it. I work hard. The Bible says to work hard to take care of your family. Right? But now I just need a little relaxation time, a little me time. We begin to say it's not that bad. Sin is not, th this little sin that I'm doing right now is not that bad. It's not hurting anybody. We begin to justify it. We even start believing something that is bad is good. We start justifying our sin again. We begin to believe what we do has no consequences for our future generations. Scripture talks about this, and I don't want to jump ahead. Oh, let me just jump in. So Exodus 25. I don't want to get too far off. I have a lot to say on that. But the second part of the script, the second part of the scripture says. I lay the sins of the parents upon the children. I, I don't know what all you guys are into, but for some of us, and I'm going to tell you right now, it scares me. I love my son. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I don't want anything to land on them because of my selfishness. God, we, we need to get this in. This is what I talk about. We, can, we need to stop being so selfish. It says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in third and fourth generation of those who reject me. It comes with a severe consequence. Not just to you. Sometimes it bypasses you. You can live a halfway decent life, but then at the end of it, you, you have judgment. But I'm talking about when these kids, when our next generations come up, isn't it crazy? I don't know about you, but in my family, my parents, my aunts and uncles, they all did drugs and they did a bunch of stuff together. They were pretty bad. But when it came to my generation, we were off, we were off on another level. This is what they're talking about. It will affect the generations to come. If somebody doesn't stand up and say no more, enough is enough in my family, then it will continue to go on and on and on and on. And it only gets worse. Number three, fooling yourself by thinking that you have enough time. a huge deception and it's one that's right under our noses and you're like well pastor what, enough time for what for what God is calling us to do we have a campaign right now of God's presence everywhere are you on board this is what God is calling us to do have you been out have you been adopter blocking have you been inviting people to our Easter services this is what God is calling you to do. We're not asking you to get up here and preach. We're asking, God is asking you to just invite your family. Bring them into the house of God so that they can hear the good news message and have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's simple. Oh, I'll do it next year. Hey, stop playing. There are people dying in our families, in this city, in the Inland Empire, every single day. What are we waiting for? Ask yourself, what am I waiting for? In Revelation 6.15, so don't fool yourself that you have time. In Revelation 6.15, look, I will come un as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are those who are watching for me. Keep their eyes, keep their, uh, keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. We're putting off the calling of God on our life. And it is affecting the next generation. 
You think because you don't want to sign up for a discipleship class, it's only affecting you? You think because you don't want to walk up here to the altar and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's only affecting you? How many moms and dads do I got in here? How many grandparents do I got in here? We need to move. We need to move like never before. Time is short. And anybody over the age of 40, guys, that I'm going to tell you right now, we know that time is slipping away. I wake up and I'm like, what year is it? Hold up. It's going by, guys. Procrastination is the biggest killer. Procrastination is the biggest killer of a legacy of excellence. We are pa- too many of us are passing down a legacy of procrastination. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, you know what? Daddy's really tired. I have to check myself constantly. Daddy's really tired. I put in all these hours and I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Hey, we'll, do, we'll, we'll study together tomorrow. Procrastination. And then what do we do? I pass that on to my son. And then he starts doing it to his son. Next thing you know, it's getting worse and worse and worse. There's no time. I want you to understand, guys, this is not a condemnation message. I'm, this is not here to condemn anybody. But this is the message to get us realigned, to get us refocused, to use the word of God as a mirror, to hold it up and say, okay. We say, okay, you know what, man, I'm not doing that. It's okay, we recognize it. The worst thing you could do is deceive yourself and say, eh, hey, yeah, he's, he's talking up there, he's crazy, he's talking to the person next to me. If you're thinking that right now, no, I'm talking to you. Just saying, guys. But not only that, we're doing this with a purpose to change the next generation. We should show our families, we should show our children the beauty in what we're doing, the beauty in our faith, right? We shouldn't be walking around, oh, I have to go to church on a Friday now. I was already there last Sunday, and then I got to go Wednesday, and now Pastor Monk goes, Friday 2, 6 a.m.? We talking about we get to do this. How are our family, how are our children going to get excited about this if we aren't excited first? So I want to right now. Can, so leaving a legacy, and I want to talk just just really quickly. What we're passing on to the next generation. Because all of us are passing something on. My parents passed on, and, and this was, I'm half Irish, half Mexican. And in both of those cultures, drinking at eight years old was the thing to do. It was okay. It was, it, it, and we're talking not just from my mom and my dad. We're talking from my grandparents, from my great-grandparents, all the way back into Mexico and Ireland. And there's these things that they've got and they passed on. From, grand, from generation to generation to generation, it's three things. Drinking, fighting, and neglecting their families. That's what was being passed on. But there had to be a day when somebody said, no, this will not continue. This could be your day to th- if you stop and you think about it. Because nobody in the history of my family... Or on my wife's side either was a Christian. We took a stand together and said, you know what, we're fighting. It will not be passed on. I have some pictures really quick. I want to show you what what I was passing on in the beginning to my family. That was me about to go on vacation. With an awesome, I I, I had an Uber driver and everything. The next one, this is what I was passing on. My children thought it was okay. I'm passing on gang violence. I'm passing on, hey, I don't know how many times that I got, we had guns in the car, and I'm telling them, hey, watch out, don't, don't hit it, it's loaded. 
Even one time, stupidly, I get pulled over and I hand my son a gun, tell him, hey, put this in the back. While I had an open container and a Mini-14 assault rifle in the very back of the truck. These are the things that I'm showing my children to be okay. The next generation is going to take that and they're going to run with it. I had to stand up and say, enough is enough. This is no longer going to be taking place in my household. And I thank Jesus Christ every day. Can we put the next picture up? This is what I'm showing them now. I'm showing him because guess what? The words that I use today are going to influence him for the future. All's my son here. This is all he hears. Discipleship. Discipleship groups. He's got Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. This is what I'm passing on. Next picture. Men meeting in the house two times a week. He comes in. He's like, oh, there's Bible study again, Dad. Next picture. When I talk about this is a bolt, there's all kinds of people around. I'm like, no, take this picture. We love God. We don't want to be ashamed of it. There's a boldness that comes with it. Next picture. S studying the word of God. We sit down, we take time, and we study the word of God. Next one. Or is that the last one? I probably had a million of them, but I just. But you guys, this is what we need to begin to show our next generation. If we start beginning to show them a half-heartedness walk, a half-hearted walk, a lukewarm walk, guess what they're going to be? Exactly what we show them. We need to begin to take this more serious, you guys. And I'm not going to leave it on a, a bad note here. In Exodus 26, and this is the very next verse. It says, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love and obey my commandments. That if that's not something to be excited about, if it takes me, okay, let's just put to the side a, a, a fact that Jesus died on the cross for me personally. If that wasn't enough, this right here, that he will lavish, he will lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations if I love and obey his commands. What are we waiting for, church? What are you waiting for? And I, go, I know I go a little bit deep on the dads because I know the, 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 I know the power, I know the authority that God has given you as fathers. One dad submitted to God can change future generations. A thousand generations. So my question is, what are you passing on? Think about that for a minute. What are you passing on to your children? And do not think for a second that they don't know. Oh, I just have this little porn addiction. It's slashed away. It's not hurting nobody. You think they don't know? Kids are wanderers, man. They find some crazy stuff. And they put it back exactly the way they found it, too. <laughs> Until one of them picks up your gun that you got lying around, picks up a joint. Pick, I don't even know if they smoke joints anymore. However they do it these days. Pick something else up. We need to be careful what we're passing on. The greatest thing that we can pass on is our faith. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. We need to make sure that we're teaching our children the word of God. Pastor Susie's doing an incredible, incredible job. But it is not. It is not Pastor Susie's job to teach them, your kids, the word of God. That is your responsibility. First. They come over here and they can get all the love and they get excited and they just, it's like a dessert to them. Extra word. But it's up to you. The second thing is to teach them how to worship. Oh, that's the picture that was missing. 
There's a picture of me and my son when he was younger. We're, we're in here and we're worshiping. I got my hands up. I don't know who took the picture, but then my son, he's got his hand up worshiping too. He's bold. He's not afraid to worship. And the last one is to teach or is to, to teach them to be a disciple, but not only to be a disciple, but to make disciples. What I'm beginning to do right now, because this is the call of God. This is the mission that God has given us, right? And I want him to know that I value, I value him. I love you, son, and I want, I want you to prosper. But there's people out there that are hurting, lost, and broken. And if you don't reach them, nobody's going to do it. These are the things that I teach them. And I'm, I'm going to leave it with this very last thing. Let's pass on a devoted, God-loving, people-loving, truth-seeking, discipleship inheritance. This is what we will leave behind. Got quiet on that one. I know you're all clapped out. And I don't know who said this quote. I heard it from Pastor Marco this, yesterday, I believe. I don't know if he has credit. I even tried to look it up so I couldn't find another name. So I'm going to give Pastor Marco credit for it. But he said, what you do is what you value. What you do is what you value. And what you value, you, value, you pass on. Soak that in for a minute. What you do is what you value. You think your children aren't watching to see what you value? Oh, I value this 12-pack in a, a football game on a Sunday. Don't be wrong, I, I love sports too. But not over me coming to church. On a Saturday, I'm taking them out with me. What do I value? I value knocking on doors and reaching souls for the kingdom. That's what I value. And what I value, I will be passing on to my children. No longer passing on the value of womanizing. No, no longer passing on the value of drinking, getting drunk, going out, neglecting my family, going out with my people. No longer valuing those things. So you guys today, and I'm ending it there. How many of you received something from this today? But this is an opportunity right now, like we said, for a refocus. This season is, is great, and it's a celebration, but it's a refocus for what God did for you and what he's requiring of you to do, to reach souls. So today, can I have everybody go ahead and stand up? Today, maybe you're like, man, you know that word, it was, it was, it was a good word. I got some good points out of it. But I want you to look at yourself. Examine your heart. What have you been putting before God that can affect? And why, why even take a chance? Oh, well, just this little bit of what I do is not that big of a deal in today's society. But it is a big deal to God. Can it, will it affect your children's 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 children? Have you got to a point where you've been so selfish, and I get it. The world says it's okay. Self-improvement, self-love, self, 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 self. Deception, 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 deception. The greatest thing that we could do to show our next generation, to show our children, to show our nieces, our nephews that we love them is by changing us. The only way that's going to happen, I couldn't do it on my own. In fact, I didn't want to do it. But if you're in here tonight and you say, you know what, man, I like what I do. I like my sin. I understand I was there. You didn't see a frowning guy up there. I, I liked it. But when I came to understand who Jesus was and what he did for me, and I'm not just saying that I just know about it. Now I believe it. I believe that he died on that cross. I believe that he took the punishment for me. When you believe it, it should activate you. Something should stir up inside of you.
will no longer leave a legacy of our children standing around and wondering if we're going to come back.